When 3D artists move from Maya or Max to Blender, there's often a moment of confusion. You go looking for a tool that you've relied on for years, but it is not there, or maybe it exists, but it behaves in a way that feels completely different. The question that probably comes to mind is why don't Blender developers just take the parts or features of Max and Maya and plug them straight into Blender? On the surface, this sounds logical. Autodesk has been developing these tools for decades, and studios depend on them. And a lot of workflows are already shaped around Maya and Max and how they function. But the deeper you look, the clearer it becomes that Blender isn't avoiding these features for no reason. So why do Blender developers do that? Before we continue, let's take a moment and talk about you model or axe. Have you ever had an experience when you are building something in Unity? Even the smallest change often means switching back to Blender or Maya. You export, re-import, spot another issue, and repeat the cycle again. It interrupts the process and pulls you out of the project, but you model or axe will be your 3D assistant inside Unity, keeping everything in one place. It brings modeling and texturing tools straight into the editor. You can extrude, bevel, and snap geometry right into your scene, which makes it easier to block out levels or reshape props without leaving Unity. There are also UV tools for unwrapping and packing, along with painting textures for quick color adjustments. And if you're working with imported assets, the UModelize function converts them into editable meshes, so you can pick details or combine parts directly in the project. I really love the idea of having a 3D assistant or modeling module directly inside Unity. The whole idea is staying inside one environment, from small edits to pressing play. So if you want to give it a try, you can use the link below for a 20% discount. The short answer is because the way Blender is built and the way it evolves doesn't allow for simple cut and paste development. And part of the answer goes back to where these tools came from. Maya and Max grew inside commercial pipelines. Studios paid for them, demanded certain features for years, and expected backward compatibility no matter what. That's why you can open a scene from 2025 that still has some tools that were developed in the early 2000s. Blender by contrast was born as an independent project and was rescued from being shut down after it was acquired by the community as an open source 3D software, which by the way happened in 2002. From that point onward, it has been open source, shaped by whoever contributes to it. Decisions aren't made to satisfy paying customers in the short term. They are made with the idea that the software should stay coherent and maintainable in the long run. This culture difference explains a lot. Autodesk software generally carry layers of old systems that can't easily be removed. Blender developers, on the other hand, have more freedom to rebuild things even from scratch when the software shows its limits. And this actually happened multiple times during its development since the early 90s. On paper, grabbing a Maya feature and dropping it into Blender might sound efficient, but in reality, it usually creates more problems than it solves. Take Rigin in Maya, for example. You will find at least three overlapping systems, classic skeletons, character setup, and human IK. Each was designed for a specific moment in Maya's history, and they are all stuck around because studios still depend on them to a certain extent. This overlap creates technical debt, which makes the software harder to maintain and harder to extend. Blender, on the other hand, tries to avoid that trap. So instead of stacking new systems on top of the old ones, they focus on building a single path forward. That's why developers are often hesitant to bring in new features wholesale, because if it doesn't integrate clearly into Blender's design, it is risking becoming a dead weight in the future. A good example of this is Blender's modifier system. Instead of copying how Maya handles the formers, Blender builds its own node-based system for geometry. The result isn't identical, but it ties directly into Blender's broader design philosophy. The same is true for rendering, where Maya depends heavily on third-party engines like Arnold, V-Ray, and so on. But Blender invested in Cycles and Eevee, except now that Maya and Max depend on Arnold, which comes with the software forever. But the fact remains that Arnold was bought by Autodesk, since it wasn't developed internally. 
Now back to Blender, that decision made rendering development part of Blender's DNA, rather than something outsourced to external vendors. Another piece of the puzzle is how development actually happened. Maya and Max evolved through Autodesk's internal roadmap, influenced heavily by studio contracts and enterprise customers, like big studios and so on. But in Blender, new ideas move through public design tasks, open mail lists, and community discussions. This means every edition has to be adjusted not only technically, but also in terms of the long-term vision. Will this tool make sense in 10 years from now? Will it integrate with other parts of Blender without creating overlap? You see, these questions matter more than copying features from other 3D software. Tom Rosendell, Blender's founder, has been very clear about this mindset. Years ago, when he was asked about catering to Maya users, he said, I'm not interested in Blender supporting Maya users, SketchUp users, or the forum trolls who don't use Blender anyway. So why would we in the first place? This might sound harsh, and probably it is. But the point is, Blender isn't trying to convert people by cloning old tools or even new tools. So according to Rosendell, it is trying to chart its own path forward. Online, you will often see Blender and Autodesk framed like rivals. Every new Blender release spawns the same headlines. And on the flip side, Autodesk loyal users will point out to missing features or workflows that Blender hasn't matched yet. The truth is, this competition mostly exists in the minds of users. Inside the Blender community, especially on the official side, there isn't much interest in beating Autodesk at its own game. I don't think that Blender developers are looking over their shoulders at Maya's feature list when they make decisions about Blender. Their focus, I think, is what most fits Blender's philosophy and what can be maintained and how over the long term. As I said before, Autodesk are built to accommodate and integrate in professional production pipelines. But Blender, on the other hand, evolved over the years based on the vision of the foundation and what the community needs in the first place. On a side note, as Blender gets more grants, and corporate sponsors, they might influence Blender to go in a certain direction by adding certain features that can help these big companies to do their work in Blender, so keep that in mind. But generally speaking, new tools sometimes appear in a year or two, but always with an eye toward keeping the software clean and functional for its user base. And history shows us that 3D software don't grow in the same direction forever. Maya became the standard in film and animation partly due to its extensibility and because studios invested in building tools around it. Max became dominant in game development because it was easier to script and faster to adapt, in its time at least. Blender, by contrast, spent years on the sideline until its open source model and steady improvements started turning into a serious option. And now that Blender is widely used, the temptation is to measure its progress by Autodesk Yardstick. But Blender's developers, I think, resist this pull. Instead of playing catch-up, they're trying to be different in a way that makes it more attractive to other studios, not just indie studios. In addition to the one, they are supporting them and helping them grow their development fund. And the overall goal is to try to keep Blender healthy over the long run, maybe in the next 10 or 20 years at least. And unfortunately for many, this means ignoring certain requests, rethinking others, and building tools that don't always match directly with what 3D artists that came from different 3D software want. And there you have it guys. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Also, please subscribe to the channel to receive more videos like this. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.